Dr. Marlene Winnell. She's been on the show before, and I had to have her back around the holidays. She is a licensed psychologist. Her uh, doctorate is in human development and family studies. She has written the book, Leaving the Fold, a guide for former fundamentalists and others leaving their religion. And uh, her organization called Journey Free focuses on religious trauma and the recovery from religious trauma. Dr. Winnell, good to have you back. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Happy holidays. Some people don't think religious trauma is a thing. I've heard some dismissive people. They're like, oh, come on, right? You Mm -hmm. stop going to church, big deal. You stop believing in the magic sky, daddy. You grew up. Let's talk about religious trauma is a thing. You want to explain? Well, I think there are like two aspects of it. One is the kind of on, ongoing trauma from being in a restrictive religion. And I'm talking about fundamentalist style, authoritarian religions that um, put people in the categories of saved and damned and have both teachings and practices that can be toxic or even abusive. And I'm talking about teachings like like telling you that you are basically bad, you're born bad, original sin, and also uh, teachings t- teaching that you're going to go to hell if you don't conform, the um, that that you should be afraid of everything in the world of good and evil, and also the practices such as isolating children from the world and not letting them grow up normally. So there are developmental delays that are pretty serious. This, that All this can go on just as part of growing up in a religion or, or joining it later. And then the other aspect is when you leave a religion, this, is a, this can be a traumatic life event because you basically have the rug ripped out from under you. The, the religion defined everything in your life, who you were, what you're doing, what the world is, who other people are, um, what's going to happen if you die? It, it, your career, your work, your love life, it defined absolutely everything. And all of that comes crashing down. And it's a devastating kind of experience to have to really um, reconstruct yourself from the bottom up. So uh, that, that can be quite traumatic. People tell me all kinds of stories, like having to stay in bed for days on end, trying to figure things out. You just don't even know who you are. So yes, there are traumatic, it, it, it varies, it, there's a range. Some people who didn't take it very seriously in the first place, or who had parents that modified it and, and, and mediated it, can claim to just walk away. So we're not saying that it's necessarily traumatic, but it can be highly traumatic. There is a parallel that I'm drawing, you tell me if I'm nuts, about uh, relating to fundamentalist religions and cults, sort of these totalistic cults where you are locked into the alternate reality. There's usually an authority figure. It can be a God figure or an actual, I don't know, a cult leader, a shepherd type. And there is an absolute removal of the identity, right? We have to surrender the individual because you will now assimilate or assume the identity of the group. Would you say there's a lot of cult-like aspects to fundamentalist Christianity, Islam, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, when people talk about cults, I just kind of laugh because I think that the large, the fundamentalist versions of large religions are, are, cult, are cults in themselves. They're, they're um, very authoritarian, either or dogmatic thinking, and um, there may, may not be a live leader, but Jesus and, and Jehovah are, are absolute leaders that you're supposed to conform to and, and obey. And then there's the scripture. People sometimes call it bibliolatry, where you, you, you worship the scripture and you can't deviate. Every word is God's word. And that's very cult-like. In this country, there is a, a, I think it's rooted in the Christianity of the United States. You know, God commanded honor your father and mother. Uh Uh, You know, it's in Exodus, it's in Deuteronomy, it's in the New Testament, in Ephesians. There's a verse in Matthew that threatens your life. Honor your father and your mother, 
And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. I think there's a version that says, if you honor them, you will live a long life. And there's an right. implied threat there. Do you feel like that we even quasi-religious or even non-religious people in this country have been infected with this, this idea that honoring means you got to put up with everything they say and do? No, I, I, don't, I don't think people live that out. I think, well, this is kind of another subject, but I think we have a lot of ageism in our country generally. So I'm not sure that fathers and mothers get honored all that much. But the reaction- Well, I'm not I talking about the elderly as much as I birthed you. I brought you into this world. This is how we mm -hmm. raised you. And uh -huh. if you then stray, you get emotionally blackmailed. This is not how we raised you. And right. a lot of people get guilted into, they're, they're locked in to an inherited world, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, in, in religious families in particular, and there's a, there's a big confusion about responsibility because of that, where, where children are feeling responsible for their parents' feelings. And it makes it very hard for for them to come out as non-religious because they're all worried about what the, what is going to do to their parents and it makes it very difficult to be honest doesn't that pinball back to you let's say you're a rebel and i have a feeling you have been a rebel in your life dr <laughs> winnell and you leave the straight and narrow and begin mm -hmm. to carve your own path and your mother and father do that shame thing. We're disappointed. There are tears, there are shouts, there are nasty conversations. You have a cost benefit as to how much grief you want in your own life, because mm -hmm. what they do can spill inside the threshold of your house, right? Um, yes, depending on how they handle it, yes. Is there merit to then playing a slower game or not telling them? I mean, how, what advice might you give? Someone's like, oh, this is grief I don't need. So maybe mm -hmm. I'll just shut up and, and at least in front of them, not be my authentic self. Maybe I just won't even appear at family functions and, you know, just leave them out entirely. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be one way of going about it. But this is a situation I call intimacy versus integrity. And sometimes people can play that game for a while or at least stay very low key and go to family gatherings and pretend everything is fine. But, but the cost is that you're not being your authentic self and that starts to feel kind of bad. You're not being known for who you really are. And people do crave being known for who they really are. So often with time, people end up needing to come out, so to speak, and in order to feel like they've got some integrity, some authenticity. So then it becomes a matter of how to do that, you know, with, and, and there are no, uh, there are no rules about how you do that or with who or how long it takes. So the, you have to navigate that so that you are having a combination of being assertive and also having compassion. Because, you know, like for your elderly grandmother, for example, and this has been the center of her life forever, uh, you know, how are you going to handle that in a way that isn't, isn't hurtful or not necessarily even include everybody? She may not even be included. But, but there is this craving, I find, with clients who are trying to uh, keep the peace, so to speak, uh, with everybody, that they end up needing needing to be honest with, with people just for their own integrity. Perhaps this is a selfish conversation because so much of it relates to my own experience. I was estranged from parents and, and with Christmas coming up. So I walk in, if I decide to go, I walk in and, you know, there's Jesus paintings on the wall and there's scriptures over the doorways, you know, as for being my house, we will serve the Lord. And everybody's talking about what happened to church and, we pray before the meal, and it's fine. I'm in somebody else's house, their house, their rules. You know, I don't raise a stink, but I do find myself conscious of the fact that I am the outlier. Uh -huh. And uh, there's an othering that happens even when no one says anything. I don't know. Does that make uh -huh. sense to you, Dr. Winnell? Well, sure. I mean, you, you're on the other side of the divide. You hear that a lot from people. I They're my tribe, but they're not really my tribe. I, I, I feel mm -hmm. like I... You know, it's the black sheep thing. I don't know how else to say. Yeah. Well, the big recommendation is to try to relate to them as normal human beings. And <laughs> the way I explain this is that I think that that Christians and other religious people have like a dual personality. 
part of them is living in this uh, so-called spiritual world that has angels and demons and and uh, you know Satan is out there trying to get you and there are uh, cosmic forces going on in the in the world and you pray and you have this relationship with this imaginary friend in the sky there's this whole spiritual part of the one side of the personality and yet there's another personality that's just a normal human being that cooks meals that enjoys food that enjoys uh going out for a walk go, enjoys gardening enjoys playing with children and can be a normal human being and they they and believers navigate these two personalities they go back and forth all the time so i think the way to relate to them is to stick with the normal human being stick connect on the human level and basically ignore the religion don't get into I mean, you may have had experiences with arguments and so forth and find out that uh, they aren't your, 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 your likelihood of persuading them to come to your side of your point of view is pretty small. So it's more if you want to have some connection, if you want to have some relationship, that it's better to just talk about those subjects that you can that, that you can connect on. Do you ever draw the hard line in the sand? There is a point when this isn't healthy and you have to say, no, I'm not going. I, I oh, will yeah. not participate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, this is a cooperative kind of thing. So if, if you find that you personally are not being respected at all in that context, that certainly um, you have a right to take care of yourself. And the way I talk about this is in terms of the inner child and the inner adult and basically um, taking care of your child to the point where you do not expose that child to a toxic situation that's going to be hurtful. Even when you start out that way, you may even go to a visit and be with them. But if it gets to where it's just too painful, you have a right to leave. You have a right to go do something else. Well, Dr. Winnell, if I can interject, what do you mean by inner child? Can you explain that? The inner child is 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 that subpersonality that you have that is uh, childlike, that's innocent, that was um, born with just the desire to to live and be free and be happy, and uh, and and is is emotional. That doesn't necessarily know how to make rational thought, plan ahead, be time conscious, um, be intentional. Is um, very just the very childlike part of you, and I think everybody has that. And it doesn't go. Your child does not grow up. You will always have an inner child, and the idea is to take care of that child so that instead of a wounded little being, you have a happy, healthy part of you that can enjoy life. So when I'm 75, will I still have my inner child? Yes, you will, hopefully. Some would argue that all men have or sort of grown up children. I mean, you should see me on Halloween. I'm a child. Anyway, that's a whole other different kind of child oh. digression. Forgive me. Um, when we talk about relationships, the word toxic is thrown all over the Internet. Uh -huh. I think sometimes it's used appropriate, and this is just me, sometimes appropriately, and sometimes I think that it's it's overused. Someone gets uh -huh. into a conflict, you're in an argument. Uh, I don't know, you have a moment of discomfort, and you perhaps overreact, you call them mm -hmm. toxic, you cut all ties. Do you use, as a professional, as a psychologist, do you use the word toxic in any context? Um, I, I use it in terms of, of particular uh, beliefs, particular dogma, and not not for people. Okay, I think that it's it's not a good idea to call it person toxic, but um, what they're using, and 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 this also pertains to just the anger that people have towards um, religion and religious people, and that is to 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 recognize that people are just people. And your parents were born innocent and, and were then brainwashed into the religion as well. They are also victims. So it's more accurate and, and emotionally more, more feasible to treat the religion as toxic rather than people. So that, um, you know, well, there's two big, big things, big teachings, for example, that I consider toxic. The assumptions 
that you are basically bad, and secondly, that you should be afraid. And those two teach those two doctrines. Those they're not doctrines; they're just uh, assumptions, beliefs that uh, go to the core of who we are. And those are highly toxic. And I think it's good to recognize that. So, if somebody on the family tree, anybody comes at you and they're like, "You disgust me! What an embarrassment you are! You're a disappointment!" You're ugly. I don't know. I mean, it, there's no threshold because I can hear the the listeners are now sitting forward in their chair going, oh, God, I know some toxic people. Dr. Winnell doesn't know what she's talking about. I mean, I would call that toxic behavior or am I mislabeling that? No, I think you're right. It's toxic behavior. Um, the thing is, the, the, the thing that we try to do with our religious people in our lives is to be assertive, to take care of yourself. And also have compassion because they are also indoctrinated and victimized. So you may and 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 so when decisions come up, um, if if they are unwilling to uh, to talk with you in a respectful way, you might want to avoid being with them and have that kind of contact with them at least temporarily. Um, but that doesn't necessarily condemn them. Where does this hyper targeting? of religious trauma come from for you personal experience oh i was raised in a in a uh, religious household and then i became very very religious myself when i was a teenager so yes i've been through it all myself did you experience trauma i mean did you have to grieve your old religion or were you named and blamed and shamed in some way my family basically avoided me and and um I have four siblings, and they're all still religious, and several of them are still are missionaries. My parents have passed away, but they were missionaries, um, so they it were all in. And I'm talking about uh, charismatic fundamentalism, um, and so I'm definitely the black sheep of the family, if you want to use that term. Um, Mostly the hard part for me was just avoiding me and not wanting to talk to me, not wanting to discuss it, not treating me like my view was uh, also valid because there's no way. I mean, we, when we, when we uh, discuss things with other uh, open-minded people, we have this kind of mutual respect. You know, we can disagree or agree to disagree uh, on, ver on a num whole number of things. But when you're talking to a fundamentalist, there is only right and wrong, right? You can be you can you can be right about something or wrong, and that's it. So um, it's very hard to have relationships that are that are deep enough to talk about important things. I'm struck by the elephant in the room phenomenon. I'll get around, you know, deeply fundy religious people who have a an opinion about me. The the apostate, you know, the the guy who left the reservation. And even though we're talking about superficial things, the weather, hey, I heard you took a vacation. How was it? Do you have any photos? Uh, we talk about a restaurant. Hey, you went to this restaurant. How was the food? We're talking just, I don't know, on the surface. Mm -hmm. But I can feel something under that surface. Did you experience that? I'm sure you've spoken to others who have. Well, yeah, and and you know, I have a I have a cousin who will not go to any family gatherings because he doesn't want to be around anybody that thinks he's going to hell. And so he's got that in his mind, and I think that we don't necessarily have to pay attention to it because it's not real, okay? So somebody maybe somebody is thinking you're going to that's that's their problem. I figure it's their problem. OK, and here's where my leprechaun story comes in. If you <laughs> <laughs> if you play anthropologist a little bit, you know, step back and observe what everybody's doing in this religion, it can be pretty interesting and pretty funny. Some of it, you know, like um, talking to an imaginary person and bowing your heads, closing your eyes and talking to an imaginary person at dinner. Um, going to a Christmas event where you're going to be discussing some little baby that was born 2000 years ago and then somehow died for you and that's supposed to make everything okay. I mean, the whole thing is very weird and, and actually interesting if you've never even, if you've never heard of it, for example, and you're just studying it 
And then you can also um, reframe the words. You know, let's say somebody, uh, your father asks you, so where are you fellowshipping now? A question like that. That's just a typical question, right? To find out what's going on with you spiritually. And you, but, but you in your, in your head, you don't necessarily say this out loud, but in your head you can think, when was the last time you talked to your leprechaun king? Or um, if say, have you where have you been to church? You know, could we translate that to when have you been out at midnight dancing with the fairies? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would you answer the question? Let's say I'm a heathen in the room. Hey, Seth, where do you and your wife go to church? Would you recommend that I, I don't know, if I hate the word keep the peace in that context and just dodge? Or should I just say, uh, we're not church goers? Or just say I'm an atheist. I don't know. I mean, I know it's situational, but you're the psychologist. Yeah, you what do you think? Whatever. Well, it, it depends on the situation, but you might want to just be open about that. And I don't go to church anymore. I've become an atheist. Or you can just say that's not a part of my life anymore and um, have it be very matter of fact like that and stay, you know, in your own integrity. This is who I am. And I, or sometimes I will give my testimony a little bit more than that and say, no, I don't go to church anymore. In fact, I'm not religious at all anymore. And I feel so much better. I feel so much freer and so much connected to life. Oh, the word testimony. You just gave it away. You, yeah, you and I so had that. You I and have, I have I that. Have of, I have a lot of fun doing that sometimes. <laughs> I went up to uh, a, a street preacher who was going on. And, and uh, when he paused, I went up and I said, hey, you know what? I understand what you're talking about because I used to be you. I used to preach and I used to believe all the things that you believe. But you know what? My life changed and I let go of this belief and all this uh, all this whole structure of thinking people are damned and, and going to hell. And now I'm just not more connected with humanity and my life is so much better. And you know what? I think that might happen to you someday. And if so, here, here's my card. You can call me and get some support. How's that go over? Do they receive that as condescending or in good faith or something no, else? No, it was like, oh, oh, okay. And then, but then the people around hearing the whole thing are just like busting up. Wow. <laughs> you grazed on something. I know you have other actual clients. I mean, I need a lot of work and I could probably keep you here all day, Dr. Winnell. But I, I, I know you've got other clients lined up who have been through religious trauma. So we want to honor that. But before we finish up, you talked a little bit about, if I heard you right, sort of the buttons that we allow other people to push. Uh huh. And I'm interested in that. You know, we, it, it's strange because I sound calloused if I say that sometimes we do allow other people too much access, too much power to be able uh -huh. to shoot us into oblivion. We, you know, um, but we also have to recognize there are many people who do have legitimate damage, open wounds, and we want to be careful with them. But I worry that we're bubble wrapping the world in ways that we that are maladaptive. At some point, you are going to have people are going to have to try at least to overcome, to try to heal these wounds and live in an often complicated and difficult world. How do you navigate these conversations about buttons and triggers and trauma? Well, I think the first step is to um, be aware of, of all of that, uh, be aware of what's going on and what kinds of things are going to be more or less difficult for you and make choices about what kinds of environments that you want to be in, depending on your own state, um, whether or not you feel like you can handle it or not. And by handle it, I mean um, having your adult in charge. Like when I talk about going home to see family for Christmas um, or Thanksgiving, to um, to go as your adult self and talk to your child before you get there and also take care of your inner child while you're there and and relate to the other people and relate to the situation as a rational adult and no and that can help you not regress i mean it's easy to regress when you're in family situations anyway and become a be, become a child in the sense that you were many years ago but to, to be careful, you're taking care of your child and talking. Like the little testimony I gave a minute ago, I'm talking as an adult. I'm talking very rationally. I'm not going to become all emotional 
and reactive to that. But you have to work with yourself and learn how to do that, especially uh, when you, you know you're going into a tricky situation, to, to do some journaling, to do some self-talk before you even go. Which segues me right into your book and website. These provide those types of resources. You want to just pitch those real fast? Well, you can certainly get some support from, well, if you go to journeyfree.org, there are lots of resources there and some services that you might want to avail yourself of. Primarily the group, the, we have a support group that meets um, three times a month on Zoom. There's a couple hundred members and you can talk each time. We, we take turns talking about how you're doing um, and any kind of growing edges that you have that you want to talk about, some challenges in your life and get the group support. And and the, the, the feeling that you have then is that you're not alone, you're not making this up, and if, if something is really difficult and painful, people are not talking you out of it, but supporting you through it. And um, you also can just brainstorm some ideas with other folks when you've got a challenging situation. It's journeyfree.org, and if you scroll down to where it says services, one of them says group support. And you click on that and you can join the group, and then you'll get emails about when the meetings are. I heard a rumor that uh, you are not just an author and you're not just a, a counselor and uh, a psychologist, but you are now a, a filmmaker or about to be, or uh, what's going on with this? It's a documentary, right? No, no. It's actually a, a feature length uh, narrative film. It's a drama. Have, yes. It's a drama. Okay. Uh, that I'm writing, that I have written and I'm rewriting now. And also, um, getting more people involved. We are looking for a producer. We do have people that have responded in, in terms of being interested in cinematography, um, composing, um, being in, involved with the production, but uh, we are de definitely needing a producer right now. The story is called Mysterious Ways. You know how often we hear that God moves in mysterious ways. Well, this is a story that you might call Big Chill Meets God. It's about uh, a group of people that were uh, in a Christian boarding school when they were in high school, and they come together after 20 years. Some of them have left the faith and some of them have not. So there's all this conflict about uh, philosophy and religion. There's also a personal drama because an old, old, uh, romance gets gets kicked up, and also uh, one of the members finds out that his call from God that sent him into missionary work was actually a trick with somebody that was talking through the ventilator system while he was praying. So he finds out that his whole life is built on a, on a lie. And so we have this whole theme of what's real and what's conjured, and what can you, what kind of responsibility do you have to manage your own life instead of looking for God's will? And what is God's will anyway? So there's a lot of good stuff in it. And it'll be, a, I, I'm pretty sure it'll be a good movie. I will link the website and your book in the description box of this conversation. Heading toward Christmas, people feeling anxiety, final thoughts, advice, counsel for anybody watching or listening. Yeah, if you're going to visit family, to um, work out what your intention is ahead of time and, and uh, have a journal that you're keeping and also take with you to keep track of um, what is what is your intention? What do you want? What Are you going to go there? Are you, are, do you plan on coming out or are you going to, is, is this really a, a good time for that? Probably not. But if you're planning on being with family, what, what do you want out of it? And to think about it in both in terms of being assertive and compassionate. And, you know, what kinds of things do you want to do while you're there? Do you want to um, play with the kids, make cookies, cut snowflakes out of paper? Um, what kinds of things are you interested in and what are you not interested in? Can you say clearly to your parents that you're not going to the, the service, the Christmas service, and be fine with that? And maybe even practice with a friend what you're going to say and be clear with them ahead of time. You know, I'm coming and you might say you're coming for a day or two instead of several days like you normally have in the past, but to, to just try and be as clear as you can. And if you run into a, a problem, I'll give you Dr. Winnell's cell number. You can just call her from on Christmas day and 
ask her what to do next. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you and your work, your counsel, your expertise. You're always a joy to speak with. The links to your work, the book, and the website are in the description box. And in advance of the holiday, I hope it is a wonderful time for you and yours. And thanks for talking to us. Okay. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it.